I'd like to tell you a story. On a hot, humid afternoon in Virginia in 1980, I was a little boy playing in the neighborhood playground with my friend D. My family had moved from Boston a few years before because my mom worked for Voice of America in the Soviet Armenian division as a broadcaster. She had seemed worried lately. I didn't know that it was because 52 American diplomats and citizens, some of whom she knew, had been taken hostage in Iran in what would become one of the longest hostage crises in history, lasting 444 days. I was just a little boy, unaware, playing with D on a summer day. His family was from the Philippines. All my friends at the time were non-Armenian. They were Cuban, Indian, Syrian, Irish, Australian, black. So Dee and I were playing on this small merry-go-round. One of us would push it hard to make it spin faster, while the other would try to stand up and balance without falling down. There was no one else around at the playground except two older white boys sitting on a bench. They were wearing denim jackets and drinking something from a paper bag and smoking cigarettes. At some point, they approached us, and one of them asked me, hey, where are you from? The other kid laughed and said, probably one of those asshole Iranians. Yeah, his friend said. Come on, sand nigger, where are you from? I remember being dizzy from the playground, from spinning round and around. I remember having no idea what an Iranian is. I remember looking up at these boys who were probably not much older than me, probably 13 years old, but they seemed like really big, scary guys. And it was the first time I'd been asked this question, where are you from? I never thought about that before. Where am I from? Being from somewhere had never occurred to me as being something that mattered. I don't know. I'm from here, I said, nervously. No, you're not. One of them pushed me, and I fell against D. Not knowing what it could be that they wanted to hear and getting more frightened, I said, I'm from Boston, you know, like you. They started laughing, walked away. A few minutes later, I suddenly felt something fly right by my head. The older boys had walked up a small hill and were throwing rocks at me and Dee. There was a slide nearby, and the cover of the slide was the shape of a mushroom. So Dee and I ran into it, very confused, very scared. And I'll never forget the sound of those rocks clanging against that metal, one rock after another, making this terrible sound and ringing in our ears. And Dee and I, my friend and I, being scared and shaking, but somehow, in our own innocent way, being protective of each other. I'll never forget the sound of those boys cackling and yelling, why don't you and your gook friend go back to where you came from, losers? Probably didn't last more than five minutes, but it felt like forever. When it was over, I noticed Dee was crying a little, and so was I. They're stupid, Dee said. Yeah, I said. We went home and never talked about what happened that day. And that day was the first time I was told by my mom and dad that I'm something called an Armenian, even though I was born in America. It's not that I didn't know we were Armenian exactly. I knew that. But it never occurred to me that that should matter one way or another. That was the first time I was told that there are different types of people in the world and that some of those people hate each other. I remember being filled with confusion and fear and this very strange, raging sense of injustice, though I couldn't articulate it or understand it at the time. But that hot August day in Virginia, that was the day I swore to myself that what I am before anything else is a human being, period. So what I want to tell you today about corruption comes from that simple fact that I am a human being, flawed, imperfect, just like all of you. I'm fatigued and frustrated by a society that's allowed itself to slip into a coma of confusion, and hyper-individualism, consumerism, nationalist rhetoric, corporatism, a coma induced by a lack of true ideological vision, complexity, inclusivity, compassion, 
and imagination. Now, perhaps some of you are going to disagree with the things I say or that I'm about to say, so let's start by agreeing on something. There are many good things happening in Armenia. There are productive, good people doing productive, good things here. So let me say that again. There are many good things happening in Armenia. Are there people saying that there are only bad things happening in Armenia? I don't know, maybe. But not on any serious level. And if there are, they're fools. But what I want to argue here is that anyone who uses that to bully the rest of us with the tyranny of positivity is a more dangerous fool. An obsessive focus on positivity is one of the biggest signs of disconnection and lack of depth. The tyranny of positivity is the oppression of spiritual and intellectual honesty and complexity. So to be only critical about Armenia or only positive about Armenia is just a way of seeing what you want to see and believing what you want to believe. At the same time, I'm not making a false equivalency here uh, like so many of us do these days. Oh, come on, there's corruption everywhere. What's the problem? Just look at Trump, look at Putin, look at Erdogan. There are problems in any country. Don't be so negative. Such statements are empty words. They only deflect from the matter at hand. We are in Armenia. We're talking about Armenia, Armenia's specific context, realities, deep-seated issues. I kind of don't give a crap what it's like in the United States or Israel or Italy or China. We're here. And the realities in other countries don't lessen the truths, the urgency, the depth of the many kinds of problems right here, right now, this reality. So even though it's unproductive to be only critical or only positive, if we take a breath and think about history, which we so often forget, we ignore it, or we only remember it when it serves our purposes, being so-called critical is actually always closer to truth. Being critical is usually closer to the side of justice. So, for example, in the 1950s, should black people in America have just been patient and grateful? Should they have just not complained so much? Maybe Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X should have just stopped causing so much trouble. Maybe women in the early 20th century should have just known their place and been more positive instead of protesting and demanding the right to vote. And then there's the, Ottoman, uh, the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire before 1915. Maybe they should have counted their blessings and minded their own business instead of wanting more dignity and self-determination. I don't know, maybe the genocide could have been avoided with more positivity and innovation. That sounds absurd, right? So how is it any different for the vast majority of Armenians in Armenia who for 26 years have been left behind voiceless against the plundering and disregard for ethics they see around them, whose children keep dying in a war with no end, who keep emigrating in large numbers and are being forced to accept a version of capitalism that's been broken and wreaking spiritual and mental havoc in the U.S. and other countries for decades. The kind of corruption I'd like us to think about is the kind that wears people down on a micro level the microaggressions in our everyday interactions that drain people psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, until all they have are complaints and cynicism, which then they're blamed for having. The corruption that we tend to focus on at the business, state, and institutional level comes from the deeper, everyday corruption within each worker, each student, and each parent. It comes from inside you and me. It's a psychic and spiritual corruption, and it doesn't matter whether it's intentional or not. The corruption at the top is just the institutionalized version of the more private, cultural, micro forms of corruption within each of us. So I'd like to just point out here that, of course, I'm giving this talk in English, obviously, and I'm not from Armenia. Although I've been living here since 2014, I'm not a repat, I'm an expat. And how we use words and ideas is one of the most important and telling things about the health of a society. Part of the corruption of critical discourse that we're facing today 
has to do with the simplistic, problematic, misinformed ways that diasporan Armenians view local Armenians and how local Armenians view diasporan Armenians and how both sides think about what it is to be Armenian and what Armenia should or shouldn't be. Both sides are to blame for taking each other for granted, ignoring complexity, not being completely honest in their motives and interests, and too often being condescending to each other. Such rigid and misinformed views leave little room. There's no room there for self-reflection, self-questioning, inclusivity, genuine growth, progress. We can't just point at corruption like it's some alien thing out there outside of us, having nothing to do with us. So diasporan Armenians must have more rigorous, rigorous, fresh, and messy conversations among themselves, and so must Armenians native to the Republic. We all, in the diaspora, in Armenia, have to talk honestly about what we've been doing or not doing for 26 years, and about what our vision is other than some shallow early 20th century version of patriotism. What do we actually want for Armenian society and the diaspora? Startups, wine bars, tourism, NGOs, those things alone are not enough. At our core, you and I, what exactly do we believe in? What is it that we believe in? Not as Armenians, but as human beings. A monolithic, uniform view about a country is the fastest way to suffocate the true potential of that country, which is its youth. So I've been teaching um, at the American University of Armenia since uh, 2014. It's the reason I moved here. I'd never visited here before until I moved. Um, and every semester, or pretty much every semester, um, there's a knock on my office door, and it's uh, a student, usually from a different department, usually a male student, and they want to speak to me privately. They come to me very kind of formally, like we're about to do business or something, and they, they ask if they can talk to me privately. And on the surface, they look like these average guys, kind of tough guys. They have the, you know, kind of uh, black jackets and the haircuts and all that stuff. Um, and they're usually, they study business or computer science or something like that. And um, I'm not knocking those uh, disciplines. I want to be really clear here. There's nothing wrong with studying business and computer science. But too many young people, and especially men, go into more vocational fields because they come from a system that too often makes them think that the only thing worth doing is transactional. That makes money. A system that no longer values or invests in serious cultural production unless there's a profit. Now, of course, people need jobs. I don't, is there anyone arguing anywhere in the world that people don't need jobs? I don't think so. Um, but the vibrancy, the health, the exuberance of a nation and the future of a nation doesn't come from jobs. It comes from culture. That's where it comes from. The reason you're all proud to be Armenian is because of the Armenian culture. And I think we've lost sight of that. So every semester, some of these tough guy students come to my office and they awkwardly say, um, so I heard about the creative writing course. You know, sometimes I write too. Oh, yeah? I say, what do you write? They become really shy. They pull their chair a little closer to me. And they, as if like in a whisper, like it's taboo, they say, well, I write, I write poems. I write science fiction. I write plays. I write short stories. Or, I don't know, I just like to write. It happens every semester like a wonderful ritual. And it humbles me. It moves me. It reminds me not to judge others so harshly. More importantly, it reminds me that young people, many young people, they can always see right through a government's bullshit, a society's bullshit, and their parents' bullshit. There are young people, all, they're right here today, there are young people all around us who intuitively know that what binds a people to a nation, ultimately, is something much deeper and more intangible than jobs, money, and status. They can get those things in other countries, too. But the power of art, the imagination, creativity, critical thinking, and language, now that's something that can turn someone from a passive citizen into an individual armed with the self-knowledge and depth to reinvent him or herself. And each time you reinvent yourself, 
truly discover yourself and question yourself and your surroundings, that's when you take part in the reinvention and reinvigoration of a nation. And that's when you crush corruption. So if there isn't an honest effort on a national and personal level at self-reflection, then what is Armenia? Armenia is just a place where people engage in various transactions to survive or get rich while waiting and planning for their chance to leave. Or it's a place for diasporans to live out some fantasy about a romanticized homeland. Or worse, it's a place for opportunists. This is the republic of Armenia. It's not the corporation or mall or startup or fantasy of Armenia. Let's remember that a republic is a state in which supreme power is held by the people and their elected representatives. In other words, you are the republic. You are the republic. Perhaps many people have forgotten that, or maybe people are just really tired, and they've started to give up on that idea. So the first step is to reclaim who you are. The citizens of a republic are the republic and must hold themselves accountable first before blaming others. Now, that being said, neither I nor anyone else should claim to understand or to truly understand the daily indignities, struggles, problems that people throughout Armenia or any struggling country go through that, that they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. No one has a right to tell poor Armenians, unemployed Armenians, disenfranchised Armenians, young Armenians, to look on the bright side, be more patient, be positive, stop complaining. You and I complain or get annoyed if we don't have internet for a few hours, if someone cuts in front of us at the supermarket, if the taxi smells like cigarettes, if the pub smells like cigarettes, if they screw up our order at a nice restaurant, or if we lose our iPhones. Corruption in government institutions, education, and business starts and ends with the corruption inside our own hearts. If we want to truly change a nation, we have to begin by changing ourselves, and not in a superficial, let's all be positive way, but by being honest with ourselves, with who we are, about our own hypocrisies and flaws, and questioning our motives and beliefs. But how are we supposed to do that? What are we supposed to do? One way is by genuinely embracing four concepts. Radical respect, radical compassion, radical accountability, and radical love. I don't mean this in some new age, touchy-feely sort of way. Um, this isn't an exercise in us feeling better about ourselves. It's about digging deep into ourselves, reflecting on who we are as individuals. It's about having messy discussions and being kind, decent human beings before being anything else. Just being a human being, accountable to yourself and to others, compassionate to yourself and to others, loving to yourself and to others. Do you remember that? Can we remember what it's like to just be a human being? Remember? There used to be a time when we were just human beings. But there are forces in Armenia, in the world, they count on us forgetting our humanity. But the mystery and the beauty and the power of our humanness is that it always finds a way to shake us awake just when the day seems darkest. So I don't claim to have any answers, um, but I believe that the path to a better society is through tough questions, not easy answers. And I believe the end of corruption in Armenia doesn't begin with diasporans or outsiders or anything like that. It begins with you. It begins with Armenian citizens. Listening to each other, listening to young people and poor people, listening to those who feel ignored and alienated, listening to the yearning and complexity inside your own hearts. If we can remember and re-become thoughtful, ethical, compassionate human beings, I think we'll be surprised at how quickly corruption will start to crumble. Maybe we can start right here, right now. Let's be kind to each other, respect each other, have empathy for each other, not because we're Armenians, not because of someone's status or wealth, not because you want something, but because you are something. You're a decent, caring human being like those two little kids who protected each other one summer day in Virginia. 
because they didn't care about where they were from. We're all human beings. And deep down in our hearts, we all know a secret. Corruption is for losers. Thank you.